It really is an honor to be here, and I had never anticipated being in such a beautiful uh, hall. What a, what a delightful place to give a talk. Uh, yeah, uh, if you, so the first slide, yes. Uh, I was recently honored in Arizona for, and uh, given an innovation award. It's really an award that went to a team of people, and I've been involved with this team now for many years. And it was in recognition of a treatment for Ebola. So unless some of you have read a little bit recently, you may wonder why I went and brought along a tobacco plant. Well, what, what's this got to do with anything? I'd say, first of all, the early part of my career was as a plant biologist. I grew up on a farm in Minnesota, the, uh, the, the bachelor, Norwegian bachelor farmer, if you ever listened to Garrison Keillor. I grew up in uh, Lake Wobegon or something very, very close to it. But anyway, I, I grew up knowing plants and, and uh, agriculture. And for the first part of my career, I studied how light is absorbed, how chloroplasts convert light into uh, solar energy into uh, chemical power. And in the process got involved in trying to use molecular genetics to modify plants so I could understand the photosynthetic apparatus. Uh, a variety of things came along, and, and it led me to use my understanding of plant biotechnology uh, technology in a new direction. And I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. So I'm going to take you back and forth in a period of time. But the next slide, please. Let me take it back just a little bit right now to Monday, August 4th. I got an email uh, from Larry Zeitlin. Larry and I have been working together for uh, 14 years or so. I've known him even longer. A very, very clever guy. He's the president of a company called MAP. Now, you don't have to be too impressed by being a president of a company with only 10 employees, but he is the president of it because he helped uh, found it. A very innovative uh, uh, individual whose expertise is antibodies. And he was writing because we we're working together on uh, manuscripts for the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a rather prestigious journal, and we were going to put together a paper on the preclinical studies of a group of antibodies against Ebola and how they work in monkeys. And so he, he started writing that, but he said, not sure if you have seen the news yet, but the story has broken about ZMAP being used on Ebola patients. And then he was asking, should we let PNAS know? Maybe they want to do a press release. Maybe they want to do something. But I hadn't heard about this. So next slide. I, I went uh, onto uh, Google search, Ebola patients, and all sorts of things started popping up. But the first one that came up was from Bloomberg News in, in New York on August 4th. And the title was, Ebola Drug Made from Tobacco Plant Saves U.S. Aid Workers. It was actually two American missionaries that they were talking about. One was a doctor, one was a uh, health professional over there. In the process of treating people who were suffering from Ebola, they both came down with the Ebola disease. Uh, and they said, a tiny company provided these experimental drugs. Well, the tiny company I knew, of course, was MAP Biotherapeutics, of which Larry Zeitlin is the president. And Larry and, and uh, the CEO of this company have been adjunct faculty with us in our uh, institute at Arizona State University for a number of years. So... Uh, well, we went on, and well, anyway, I started reading the press, and, and a lot of this, a lot of the information I got was uh, over the next few days because the uh, press knew more about it than I did. I didn't have any access to what was going on, on in Africa. But Dr. Kent Brantley down here uh, had been in a progression of Ebola. So if, if you know anything about Ebola, the first symptoms are really sort of like the flu. Uh, you, you get a headache. Uh, you ache all over, uh, you, you, you just feel like, you feel miserable. Uh, Follow-on uh, uh, problems are uh, diarrhea, vomiting, uh, severe things, and, and eventually 
the virus begins destroying the endothelial cells of the blood vessel, and the blood vessels destroy and are destroyed, and you essentially bleed from the inside out, and just shedding massive amounts of uh, Ebola in the process. Well, fortunately, Brantley and the other missionary were in an early stage of progression. And uh, it turned out that there were two vials of this ZMAP, this experimental vaccine, available. They had been carried to Africa personally by one of the scientists who's this vast team of people who've been working on ZMAP. He took them along in, in, uh, on a flight because he was going on <clears throat> humanitarian work into Africa, and he took them along. He first offered them to Doctors Without Borders and, and asked if they wanted to use ZMAP on one of the African uh, doctors who was involved and who had gotten sick. In their wisdom, uh, Doctors Without Borders recommended to this doctor, the African doctor, he said, I don't think you should do this, it's experimental, it's never been tested in people, we don't know if it'll make you worse. Unfortunately, the guy died. But that left two vials of material. And, and as I go back through this in, in my mind, there were so many things that were fortuitous. It just worked right. This guy arrived with two vials. These two people were sick. They both had medical backgrounds. They understood Ebola. They were uh, medically aware enough so they could understand the question, would you like to take an experimental drug even though it's never been tested in people? Do you want to take the risk? Well, actually, it, it didn't seem like that hard a decision. Their family was planning their funerals. And if you're, you don't have any other option, they made the right decision. They said, yes, we'll take the experimental drug. And it was given to the two of them. And according to Brantley, he said within an hour, he felt better. The next day, he was able to walk out of the hospital in Africa, get on a plane, and they flew the two missionaries to Emory University in uh, the United States. And three weeks later, they left the hospital. He's uh, been on TV shows and all over the place since then. No side effects with either individual. Eventually, some more of ZMAP was sent over there, and it has now treated seven people. Five recovered, uh, a, a Brit, two Africans, three, three African healthcare people were treated. Two of them recovered. I have not been able to discover the history of the third individual. And prob well, oh, and, and another one who got it but died was a Spanish priest. He got one dose. This was a very elderly priest. The disease had progressed rather far into uh, its cycle, and he probably got it too late, but he died after one dose, and they flew him back to Spain. The, the only one that's unexplained, at least in my mind, is the, the African, who, um, African doctor who did not recover, and I, don't, I simply can't tell you why, but five did. Five people have recovered totally. It's not a very big sample, um, and people ask, well, did it really cure, it cure these people? As a scientist, I cannot say to you that ZMAP cured anybody because there, there's no control experiment. They didn't take an equal number of people and give them a sham drug and see, you know, watch, see if these die and these didn't. It, it, and we'll never, we aren't going to do that way. I'm going to come back to this whole issue of how we develop drugs. So you ask me as a scientist, can you prove ZMAP worked? I can't. You ask me as an individual, and I say, the way these patients responded was exactly the way that the animals, the, the, the monkeys, responded in the pre previous clinical trials. So to me, there's a very tight correlation. It needs more work, and I'm going to come back to this. How much work, I mean, how much research should we do before we give it to more people? It, it, we're in a fascinating, challenging time right now. Okay, so within hours after these people, two Americans got uh, this experimental drug. The press was going crazy. 
What is this stuff? They call it a secret drug developed in collaboration with the U.S. Army, which is sort of cold words or, oh, this is really sneaky stuff. We don't know what's going on. And the other question is, how come the Americans get it? Why didn't they give it to the Africans? I mean, who's in control here? Is this ethical, etc.? And of course, is there more of these drugs? So in order to try to give you some feeling how, how I feel, this is a personal talk. I, it's, uh, I'm, I'm giving you science, but I'm going to give you my interpretation about things. I have to take you back in time. Let me take you back to when I got involved in using green plants to manufacture pharmaceuticals. Our first publication was in Proceedings to National Academy of Sciences in 1992. Uh, it, it, by that time, there was a good vaccine against hepatitis B. It had been approved, introduced in 1986. That vaccine is made in genetically engineered yeast cells. They're transformed. They contain the one gene. The gene that they put into the yeast cells is the protein that encodes the surface protein of the hepatitis B virus. In yeast cells, that protein is produced. It self-assembles, makes a virus-like particle. You break the yeast cells open and uh, purify these virus-like particles. They're empty. They don't have any disease-causing component but they're a mimic or a decoy for our immune system so that when they inject it in your arm, your body says, I'm being invaded by the hepatitis B virus, and you mount an immune response. It's now a $2 billion a year drug around the world. Uh, at the time we were doing these experiments, only about 35% of the global population had access to this vaccine because it was too expensive. So we stepped back, my colleagues and I, and we said, if yeast can make this protein, to me, yeast is a plant, it just doesn't have chloroplasts, so it's a funny little uh, chlorotic plant. If, you, if yeast can do it, I bet you I can make a tobacco plant do it. And so we put the same gene for that hepatitis B protein into plants to make a transgenic or a GMO tobacco plant. And then from that, we were able to recover, grind up, and, and, and get the vaccine. We also put the gene into uh, tomatoes, and I'm going to come back. But let's see what the next slide is. Uh, oh, I should just say, in, 1980, in, in 92, when we were doing this, we were very aware of all the tremendous developments that had been coming over the last, uh, oh, roughly 50, 60 years in making new vaccines. Probably the first big splash was really the polio vaccine, which has almost eradicated polio from the globe. To make the polio vaccine, you culture the virus in fermented or cultured monkey cells. So you've got a big vat of monkey cells, you add some virus that infects, and then you can propagate and get a lot of virus. Uh, and and you, there's attenuated, uh, it's weakened strains that can be used in like an oral vaccine or you kill it and you use it in an injectable vaccine. So all that, that's precedent. And, uh, but it was monkey cells, uh, monoclonal antibodies. We've got a, r roughly at the present time, there's about $30 billion worth of antibodies sold around the world as cancer drugs. Perceptin, Rituxin, Avacyn, all the synthesis, end with N. All these drugs that Genentech initiated, now a number of companies around the world make them. They're all antibodies that are targeted at specific aspects of the cancer cell in our body, but they're antibodies. Uh, we know that flu vaccine is made in eggs, and then there's all these other things like the hep yeast and hepatitis uh, B virus. A simple message, if you don't remember anything else, is if you want to make a protein drug, an antibody or a vaccine, you have to have a living system. You can't make it in an test tube. It's not like making aspirin or... or it, it's not a chemical structure. A protein has variability, 
and maybe someday, 100 years from now, we'll have a synthetic system of doing it, but today you have to use a living system. So we said, why not this living system, which pharmaceutical companies hadn't looked at? The other point that we were interested in the, at the time came with the sophistication that developed from the 50s through the early part of the current century. Every time improvements have been made, they add expense. And I don't want to downplay the expense of the regulatory side. That's, it's huge. Next slide, please. Uh, if you come up with a new antibody today to treat cancer, you would look at the experience of, say, Genentech. You come up with a discovery up there, a new uh, compound, you do preclinical, which means you test it in various animals, you do toxicology to so, show it's safe, then you go through three phases of human clinical trials, they can extend various periods of time, like the last papillomavirus that was introduced, clinical trials took almost 10 years to complete. Uh, clinical trials themselves took a billion dollars for Glaxo and for Merck. They in, both introduced the same uh, uh, drug. A billion dollars of investment uh, to, to make a new product and then you finally license it. When you make a protein drug, and I'll talk about the U.S. because that's my, most of my experience, the regulatory bodies treat it as regulation by process. If you're making a new chemical drug, let's say you make a new aspirin or a variation of aspirin, that's a chemical compound, and they regulate you on the quality of the chemical you produce so that you can use mass spec or GC or whatever it might be and prove that you've got exactly the drug that you say you do and that's what you're selling. It doesn't work that way with proteins. So the Food and Drug Administration and the European equivalent in their wisdom have said, if we can't analyze it for perfection at the end, we're going to regulate you on how you make the drug and you have to set up a process and we approve the process and then you got to stick with it. So if you're building a facility, uh, probably the last big one that I know about that was built is in Vacaville, California, where Genentech spent a billion dollars to make their rituxan uh, uh, facility. A billion dollars for bricks and mortar. It's a huge building, you can see it from the freeway. No windows, just an enclosed building, lots of fermentation, everything on the inside. To get approval for that building, the people at Genentech worked over a five-year period in collaboration with FDA, submit their blueprints, you know, okay, that looks all right, change this, start the construction, they come in and do inspection, make good changes, all the way through. It's a billion-dollar building in about five years to do it. Why don't these companies work in things like Ebola? Think about it. Who's going who's gonna to buy the Ebola? Well, until this epidemic, we'd had a few hundred people involved. You got a few tens of millions of people with cancer from the, that might need this. And the people who need Ebola therapeutics are poor. It's, you, you, you just don't think about sinking this sort of money in drugs for poor people in poor countries. So we said, now I'm going back again, this was logic. Some of it was naive academic logic, but I'm an academic and we're allowed to do that. But, but the logic was, if you use something like this, perhaps you can change this paradigm in the regulatory process. So, our question was, in 1990, can we use plants to, and plant biotechnology to come up with a new tool for global public health and specifically, can we deal with issues of cost I haven't talked about speed too much yet, but when it takes 15 years to develop a commercial drug with all the money that Glaxo or Merck or Sanofi or whoever has, takes them 15 years, uh, can we do something to make it faster? Next slide. Okay, we did a number of things in plants. 
And a lot of what I did in the first 10 years we were working on this worked with potatoes. Never thought a potato is going to be a vaccine delivery system, but we get our grant money in the U.S. in blocks of three years. So you've got to start an experiment, get something, test the animals, boom, turn in a report in three years if you're going to get the next grant. We wanted to say, can plants make a pharmaceutical that's effective? So in this case, we put the hepatitis B vaccine into a transgenic GMO potato. Fortunately, we're in the U.S., so we don't have to deal with all this GMO stuff that you guys worry about. But we, we, we were able to go charging ahead with GMO potatoes. And then we, we, the first test was simply feed them to, to mice. Let them eat it. Take a blood sample of the mice and ask, did they develop an antibody? That is an immune response against the hepatitis B vaccine. They did. We took that data to the Food and Drug Administration and asked for approval to go into human clinical trials. As usual, it took us nine months to fill out forms and do all the stuff that's necessary. But in their wisdom, they allowed us entry into the human testing because this was, in their terms, a, a food additive. Eh, kind of an unusual additive, but it fit into all the paperwork that they happened to have. So we got approval to go into human clinical trials. The lady sitting over there with, with the, uh, that spoon, she's eating about this amount of potatoes. Um, and and uh, the only complaint we had from this was we should have allowed them to put salt on the potatoes. Uh, we hadn't put that in the protocol when we submitted our request to FDA, and since they'd approved a protocol without salt, we couldn't do salt. So anyway, next slide. This is just to give you an example of something we published way back in 2005. This, the, the ordinate here, the measurement in this direction, is the amount of antibodies specific for the hepatitis B virus found in the serum of the individuals. It's in milli-international units. This is what hospitals use all the time. We fed the potatoes at three times, indicated by the arrows, and these are weeks. If we fed plain old grocery store tomatoes, nobody's going to be surprised. Nothing happened. But if we fed our GMO potatoes with the gene for the hepatitis B virus, they mounted a very good strong immune response. This was proof of principle. It said primarily that the proteins we produce in plants of a human virus retain their properties to stimulate the immune system. And secondly, it said you don't have to do all this elaborate purification that, say, Merck and Glaxo are doing when they sell their vaccine. It just works if you eat the darn stuff. It's an oral vaccine of the very most simple kind. So we were very, very excited about this. We've done it with three separate vaccines, one for norovirus for diarrhea and another one for a cholera vaccine. Essentially, we get the same sort of data in every case. So I took, uh, oh, and, and we have pursued this in collaboration with several companies. Uh, Dow Chemical had an animal health division and uh, they got a license, a, a U.S. government license, for Newcastle disease, that's a, a poultry disease uh, based upon expression of our proteins in plants. We, uh, they got the license, we did the collaboration. But I spent a lot of time working on transgenic tomatoes and, um, and, and figuring out ways we could freeze dry the tomatoes and concentrate them and put them in pills for oral delivery. Now, I would... I would say a lot of people didn't like this. There are folks in the U.S. who don't like GMOs in general either. And they really launched into us for this, saying that, oh my God, it's going to get in grocery stores, and we're going to have inadvertent uh, uh, immunization. Hell, we hadn't even gotten into human testing, and they were going berserk over this stuff. But we just sort of said, okay, okay, fine. Don't worry about it. We're going to stop that. And in part, I stopped it because I realized technically it, was, it wasn't fast enough and cheap enough for what we wanted. Next slide, please. I did try to convince Big Pharma to get involved. Gone to a number of, of companies. And 
interest zippo, not a bit. And I'm sorry, that is my phone, and I forgot to shut it off. And it's probably my wife, because she <laughs> hasn't heard from me for uh, a while, and she's just wondering what the devil I am doing. There. Uh, okay, so we took it to Big Pharma, and uh, uh, essentially they said, hey, they sort of patted us on the head and said, oh, those are really cute experiments. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, and I would like to see what you're doing. But we're not interested. And, and a number of reasons. First of all, there's no plant biology, especially biotechnology ex expertise in big pharma. It just doesn't exist. There were the GMO perceptions, because some of the biggest big pharma is in Europe. And they were sort of running scared over what negative things might come out of it. But probably the biggest thing was, by all the companies, they had never tried to get regulatory approval for a pharmaceutical produced in plants, especially for oral delivery. And at one of the meetings, George Seiber got up. He's the vice president at Merck, one of the really huge names in this business. And he just said to me, you know, I'm fascinated by what you do, but to be successful, exploit proven technology. In other words, you know, don't call us, uh, or I mean, uh, don't bother us. Uh, we've got other things to do. This was now about uh, early 2000s. Next slide, please. And at that time, uh, a number of groups had been, uh, some really good plant virologists had been doing some interesting work and the tools were becoming available to manipulate plant viruses, RNA viruses. And so, essentially I said, fine, I'm gonna forget this transgenic GMO approach, and I'm gonna switch over to viruses. And just to give you an example, we worked on it for a number of years. By 2009, we published this paper about a high-level, rapid production of full-size monoclonal antibodies in plants by a single-vector DNA replicon system. That may not make much sense, but it says, we were able to engineer a Gemini virus, it's a very common virus of plants, in such a way we could take out some parts and put in two parts, the heavy chain, the gene for the heavy chain, the gene for the light chain of an antibody, and get coordinate expression and get it to assemble. And I put this particular reference in from uh, 2009 for two reasons. One, it was done jointly with Larry Zeitlin and Kevin Whaley, the guys, our friends at MAP, which was one, uh, developing our tools to make these anti-Ebola antibodies, and these were anti-Ebola antibodies that we published on. So we were making progress. But I got to go back a little, again, I'm jumping back and forth in time, go back a little bit on a, uh, oh, uh, first I'm going to tell you how, how we do this. Now, most, not all, but almost all, uh, viruses that attack plants are RNA viruses. A little tough to work with RNA, so essentially what we do is make a copy of the RNA, move it into E. coli in a DNA plasmid. And the, the, the whole workhorse of all of biotechnology is manipulate genes in E. coli. And, and so we can redesign things in E. coli. And, and our part at ASU has been making a molecular toolbox. We take parts of this virus, parts of that virus, parts of other things, and, and, and so we can reconstruct a virus-like entity that will replicate and produce what we want. If you can, click on this uh, uh, image down here, You're right? Now just watch here. This is how we put DNA into a leaf like this. There's a syringe with no needle on it. It's a blunt end syringe. You put it up against the bottom of the leaf where the stomata are, these little pores in the leaf, and you just start squirting the liquid into the leaf. And you can see the liquid spreading out in there. Now, most of the inside of a leaf is airspace. It's uh, to do photosynthesis. The plant has to open the stomata, allow CO2 to get in, 
uh, water vapor goes back out, but the CO2 comes in, gets absorbed in the cells, light converts it into sugars, and that's how we live. In our case, we're using those open stomata to squirt a liquid in there so the, all the cells in the leaf are bathed with our genetic solution, our redesigned virus. So it just goes that fast. Now this is the way we do it in, in uh, lab scale when we're exploring whether we got the right vectors or not. But then we take these plants, we've squirted this stuff into them, they look sort of waterlogged when we're done, carry this back over, put it in a growth room, and let it sit there for another, anywhere from five to seven, ten days. During that period of time, this genetic construct we stuck in there gets into all the cells, starts a virus replication cycle, but every time the virus turns over, it spins out a copy of the genes we put in, which is an antibody. So viruses replicate fast, so we get, we end up with about a half of a gram of antibody for every kilogram of leaf material. Uh, so it probably would take about five, six of these tobacco plants to get a gram, to get a half a gram of, of antibody. I can assure you, if you were in the pharmaceutical industry, that's warp speed. It's because if you're trying to do this in Cho cells, you've got to transform the Cho cells, you've got to select them, you've got to go the batches up, and et cetera. So this offers speed to evaluate the product that you're trying to make. Uh, so again, I'm sort of beating a dead horse, but I want you to remember this. Why do we do it? Speed, we get a lot of it quickly. Scalable. If you were doing fermentation to make antibodies, you do your first run in maybe a 10 liter fermenter. You then would scale up to maybe a 100 liter fermenter. And according to FDA rules and all good scientific logic, you need to validate the bigger thing because cells grow differently in different volumes. But you really want to produce your antibodies in things that look like the size of a tank truck of 100,000 or 10, even larger liters. And so you've got to validate it again. All this is taking you time the whole way through. In their wisdom, FDA has said, if you've proven that you can produce this product in a plant, or we usually present proof for like 10 or 50 plants, they just said, okay, you want to do 50,000? It's the same production unit. So we save a huge amount of time and cost in the scale-up. The other thing is, when you are... I really should have said this back when I had that blueprint of the uh, uh, facility to make antibodies on there, when Genentech is designing their billion-dollar facility. They haven't yet proven their drug. It's, it's one of the huge problems in the pharmaceutical industry. You think you've got a new cancer drug. Everything's looking good. You're in phase one clinical trials. People are, it's working nicely. But now you're anticipating how long the clinical trials are going to be, and you've got to build your facility. So about the time you're doing your phase one clinical trial in a traditional sense, you've got to go down and visit your banker and say, uh, oh, by the way, I want a loan for a billion dollars because I'm building a facility. And he'll say, what's it for? Uh, it's for this experimental drug. Well, is it going to work? Uh, we, we don't know. We won't know for about five years. So you've got a huge amount of risk out there. You're borrowing money against the hope that you got something good. This is simpler. Scaling up, making more greenhouses, or actually we grow them now under lights and closed facilities and in hydroponics and all that sort of stuff. This is capital cost avoidance. In any business you're in, if you can avoid upfront capital costs, avoid the upfront need to go to your banker and wait till a later point in time to get that money to scale up, it's uh, time is money, money is, uh, well, whatever it is. Anyway, you save in capital costs. And the last thing is, once we have waited so this plant is producing our antibodies, we cut the leaves off, enter 
good manufacturing practice, which is purification of the protein under sterile conditions. Big rooms, guys with white uh, uh, outfits on, you know, masks, everything, keeping it uh, sterile. That's the same as it is for the pharmaceutical industry. Using actually the same technology to go that last step to make purified antibodies as Genentech would do to make their antibodies. So again, you got standardized procedures, the FDA is used to it, it's uh, relatively easy to do. Okay, I'm jumping you back and forth. My experience from 1990 to about 2000 was I was Don Quixote, I'm out to get this quest to make cheaper uh, vaccines and things with plants, uh, transgenic plants. Essentially, it was, it was fun, but it didn't go anywhere. It still hasn't gone anywhere. I hope it will someday, but I, when I come into a brick wall after I ram into it a few times, I'll start looking for a door for something else and get around a simpler way. And the simpler way was going to this viral expression when I say, uh, excuse me, down here, when I say viral expression, transient, that means the plant is not GMO, but we're putting something into it that transiently makes it a, a, a manufacturing system. 2001, it was fortuitous. Everything I'm doing is fortuitous. I don't know. I, thank you, somebody. It's, uh, but 2001 was a terrible time in the U.S. September 9th, the Twin Towers in New York were hit by planes and uh, catastrophe. Our economy tanked. All sorts of bad things happened in the U.S. But it was the first time Americans ever came to the realization that terrorism was something real. It's something we had to worry about. When Americans worry, they spend money. It's just, it's, that's an absolute equal. Uh, we spend money. And, and so money became available. And besides worrying about planes flying into buildings, it was about this time that we had an anthrax scare. Some people distributed anthrax in the Senate office building. Best place in the world to spread it because senators spend the most money of anybody, so they got scared about bioterrorism. And so we had a whole new grant program. And uh, in 2000, late 2001, uh, Larry Zeitlin and I uh, asked the military for some money because most of the money was coming through the military at that time. And the US military had a major question. Do we have the technology to respond quickly? There was a lot of concern in, in this period of time that some enemy, undefined who, was going to take some pathogen and tweak it and modify it and make it worse and, in the terms of the military, weaponize it. Make it something you could aerosol and blow into a building or, you know, where, whatever, but make it, make it dangerous. And they said, do we have the technology to respond quickly? So it's at that point, and, and, and this is really the, the flow diagram of the way people think about drug development. You get a new pathogen. Let's say it's some weird, wonderful thing that uh, a bioterrorist has come up with, and we don't, we don't have a vaccine or a therapeutic against it today. You've got to quickly discover the target that, that would make it sensitive, you got to then develop a therapeutic that'll hit that target and move that into quickly into preclinical animal trials to demonstrate it's safe and then finally go into human clinical trials. And so uh, my question, and to a large extent the question asked by some parts of the army was, we really have a good system. I would say, and I, you know, I'm proud of being American, da, 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 all that stuff, but we produce safe drugs. Not everything is perfect, but we produce safe drugs because we spend a lot of money on the safety side. But in this case, is it really what we need? If somebody comes up with a biowarfare agent that's spreading around, we can't afford 12 years to develop a... A, a new drug and try to figure out what we do in the meantime. So the military said, what's going on? And we said to them, 
uh, we reminded them of what we were doing in plant biology. And fortunately, we found people in the military, and in particularly the U.S. Army Medical Department, Medical Command, that said, hmm, you're probably crazy, but we'll give you some money to try it. And so we got about three and a half million dollars in a project called Plant Production of Vaccines and Antibodies for Protection Against Biowarfare Agents. Uh, Larry Zeitlin and I were the co-PIs, who are principal investigators on this grant. And our goal was simple, determine if we could use viral expression vectors in tobacco to make both vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. We had three years to spend that money and work on it. That is almost an exact quote, quote out of the last line of our three-year report. We have demonstrated that Ebola virus-specific humanized monoclonal antibodies can be produced using plant biology. We didn't say tobacco, but it was in tobacco. Uh, by, a lot of this didn't come out quickly, but uh, I'm, I point out that we did publish papers on this in spite of what the media said, that this was a secret drug, etc. Hell, we'd been publishing papers all the way through, but they didn't bother going in and checking to see. But in 2011, we had back-to-back -back papers in Proceedings National Academy of Sciences, Larry Zeitlin and, and the MAP guys in this one. Uh, Gene Olinger in there was with the U.S. Army uh, uh, Bioterrorism Group. Uh, Gene, and in our case, John Dye, who's on the same group, they are authorized to work with live Ebola. We do it in Fort Detrick in Maryland in BSL-4, high containment facilities. Uh, it's the only place where you're allowed to have a live uh, Ebola. In 2011, the, uh, uh, the group at MAP said, enhanced potency of a fucose-free monoclonal antibody being developed as an Ebola immunoprotectant, and we uh, published a paper which said we had a vaccine that protects mice against Ebola virus challenge. Both of these used mice as the, the test system. Now, I'm going to just, this is really a little bit too much for the generalist here, but I, I, if there's any plant folks in here, I got to tell you, this wasn't all falling off a log. There, there was a lot of work in this that I'm sort of rolling over and tens of graduate students were burned out in this, and I have to give them some credit for all the work they did. Um, anyway, why did it say fucose-free monoclonal antibody in here? Well, let me just say, antibodies are these structures, so we, we diagram this Y-shaped with two light chains, two heavy chains. The heavy chains are glycosylated. If you're not a biology specialist, glycosylation means putting sugars on it. We put sugars on all, a lot of the proteins in our body. It's part of the recognition system that, that works, in, especially in our immune system. Now, you can engineer the main structure, the antibody, in our viral vectors, the amino acid chain, but you can't engineer where the, the sugars go on you have to do that by engineering the plant itself. So next slide, please. What was done, and this is a collaborator, absolutely brilliant lady in Austria by the name of Herta Steinkellner and her team. What she did was take tobacco plants and now making them a GMO tobacco where she went in and knocked out two enzymes that put sugars on proteins. What ends up with, and this isn't one of those plants, but what ends up with is a tobacco plant that puts sugars on proteins exactly like you do and like I do. You can make a human-like protein in these modified plants. So th this was one of the steps. I'm just in one slide, I'm reporting on the work of 25, 30 people who ground away forever. They should be respected, but you know, they don't, I get the credit, they don't. It's unfortunate. Next slide, please. So here we were, about 2009, 2010, we had this ASU, my team is really into this toolbox assembly, how do we make the viruses? 
We had the guys in MAP who are really good in protein engineering to make a bigger and better antibody. Uh, uh, excuse me, that was Herta's group making the, the to human-like tobacco, and then the antibody engineers were uh, the guys at MAP. And we're all excited. And then we were brought into reality by some folks in the military, and he said, you know, we don't want just your, you know, gram and a half of sample that you're producing in your labs. We want thousands of doses of this stuff. How are you going to do it? Well, our university, we don't do thousands of doses. We're not a manufacturing place. We train young people in brilliant ideas and, you know, theory. Theory is our thing, not practice. So the military said, how are you going to make a lot of this? Next slide. Well, to their credit, along comes DARPA. This is an arm of the U.S. military that does wild and crazy research. They claim credit for uh, making the World Wide Web. Lot, in spite of what Al Gore says, I, it's really DARPA that came up with uh, uh, the World Wide Web. And they've done a whole bunch of other things. They spend a lot of money, but they spend it in, in adventuresome ways of challenging people to do something new and novel. Well, I was fortunate to be on their advisory committee, scientific board for uh, Colonel Alan McGill and something they called the Blue Angel Project. So you saw these, this arrow before, which is the logical progression of how you discover a, a new target, make a new therapeutic, get to pre-evaluation and get into human safety trials. But they pointed out, you know, to go from there to there, somebody has to make this stuff. So they recognized this, they put out a call for uh, proposals to small companies and invested somewhere between 80 and 100 million dollars in three companies in the US. One was a Canadian company, the only way they could get the, the cash was to build a subsidiary in the US because then, then we would give them money. Uh, it was uh, uh, Caliper in Texas, Medicago in uh, North Carolina, and Kentucky Bioprocessing in uh, uh, Owensboro, Kentucky. The, the guys in Kentucky Bioprocessing have also been our collaborators for the last uh, oh, eight to ten years. This was their press release March 2010. DARPA has announced that they're being awarded an agreement, plant-based system to make uh, using tobacco plants, the goal of the project is to demonstrate that plant-based systems are scalable for the rapid development of purified recombinant protein that meets all FDA requirements. No one anticipated when they got this money in 2010 that the first way they were going to prove this was around Ebola. But it turned out we had just gotten all the stuff, the antibody uh, constructs were ready, Oh, between the period of 2011 to uh, into 2013, they did multiple runs of antibodies to prove their system, to scale it up. And here we are in 2014. Well, they did, they did all the production runs in 2012 and 13. It went into animal trials for um, safety and, and efficacy. And here we are in 2014. They were the company that made the material that was sent off to Africa. This is what their system looks like. They, actually this is two years old. Pictures I took when I was there two years ago. Huge greenhouses filled with tobacco. Today they have chambers probably 10 times the size of this room. It's like a closed warehouse. Uh, three stacks, three high. They have roller belts on there. The plants are put in at the top and one end in seeded plants. They go through in hydroponics. They just slowly roll through here under lights. Finally, they come out. A robot picks them up. You can see the size of a, that tray. It's bigger than this table. It's holding a, a couple hundred tobacco plants. The plants are about this size. The robot picks them up turns them upside down, dips them into this genetic solution, 
to trigger this virus in, uh, infection cycle. The robot then puts them on another conveyor belt, they go into another greenhouse and sit there for uh, seven to 10 days, at which time they go into an automated device, just cuts them off, grinds up the leaf tissue. They've sort of got a massive wearing blender, that enormous type of grinding structure, centrifuge, filtered, goes through columns, and what you end up with is a purified sample up there. If you held up a vial, it would look like plain water, clear. Uh, it, and it's 99% uh, uh, monoclonal antibody. So that, that exists. We worked with them. Uh, they made the batch of antibodies, which in 2013 went to Fort Detrick for monkey trials. The monkey trials use relatively small numbers for both ethical reasons of not wanting to mistreat animals and for the enormous cost of doing monkey trials. Um, only anim 18 animals were tested, uh, plus, uh, uh, I think, only two controls. But of the 18, they are injected with a very high dose of Ebola, live e Ebola, so they get triggered, they get diseased instantly. And then the antibody material was given at, to some monkeys day one, some on two, three, and some on day five. And as was reported, very unusual for the director, the head of the whole National Institute of Health to come out and report on, on uh, 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 a scientific study, but as he said, all 18 monkeys were, uh, were survived the Ebola infection after receiving MAP. And it, all this data, in case you're interested, was published on August 29th in Nature. That was uh, online. I think the print copy is out right now, but absolutely recent, just working like mad to get this data out, and, and in part to, to counteract all these rumors about the secret drug and all this sort of stuff. There's absolutely nothing secret about this drug today. You can read this paper and get every last detail about what's in ZMAP. Three antibodies are described in, in, in detail. Uh, next slide, please. Tony Fauci followed this up with an announcement on September 3rd. Uh, the Health and Human Services have given a grant, not a map, for 24.9 million. It's an 18-month contract, can be extended and go up to uh, about a half a million. Uh, essentially, the, they are saying, Get going, guys. Make as much of this as you possibly can and as fast as possible. Next slide, please. So, is that justified? Uh, certainly seems to be. This 2014 epidemic, it's not the first time we've seen uh, Ebola in Africa, but it's the first time it's been an epidemic. Before, it's been a few hundred people and ended up self-containing it. So, uh, this time, WHO predicts when I wrote this slide, 1.4 million could be infected. The last I've seen is 1.5 could be infected. They keep revising it up because the disease is spreading so rapidly that it's hard to predict how many there will be. So a constant question comes, what's it going to take to get more ZMAP and when are we going to have it? So, uh, Let's see, what was I going to say here? I was going to say the first part of this took us 10 to 12 years to do, to discover the antibodies, to optimize the antibodies and get into monkey challenges. Uh, really completed it, I put July 2014, really the monkey studies were really done in 2013. It took a long time. If we had to repeat this, we could do it faster, maybe half as fast. But emphasize it's it's any drug development if you're going to do it right takes time large scale manufacturing is now the issue the investments of DARPA in three companies put together facilities that were planned to make vaccines that's what the military thought was going to be the future and for a vaccine you only need somewhere between 20 and maybe 100 
micrograms per dose. 10 to, uh, or 20 to 100 micrograms. These patients that have gotten ZMAP, they got a minimum of 10 grams IV in three doses. 10 grams. Uh, first of all, it's, it's absurd. Probably don't need that much, but we never had time to do the detailed dose recovery, thing, uh, the dose response curves that need to be done in normal development. And so those need to be done. But uh, the scale, we, we, we have built capacity based upon vaccines. We're of limited capacity for monoclonals, but they're going like as fast as they can. The guys in MAP and, and KBP are working 20 hours a day trying to get this done. Next slide. But it's a, it, it, in total, it's under 25 people doing this whole thing. They've got to get more equipment. They've got to train more people. It's, it's, it's slow. So this was on October 3, Wall Street Journal opinion page. First of all, U.S. dropped the ball. Uh, we could have done more sooner. So could the rest of the developed world. So could the Norwegians. So, you know, we could have done more earlier, but there's no urgency. We never felt urgency. Second point in this opinion article was, we now need a new standard. We can't just stick with FDA's safe and effective, meaning expensive and long-term. Instead of the typical double-blind trials, we can't take a group of people, all of you are expected to have Ebola, we're going to give you a sham tr treatment, we're going to give you the real stuff and say, oh, we're going to watch how many of you die and see how many of you live. It's just, it's just not ethical to go that way in, in this situation. Uh, a crash effort is needed. And then the last slide. For now, uh, according to the opinion article, we've got to pin our hopes on things that are still in development. Conventional, randomized, double-blind clinical trials are not possible in the throes of an epidemic. We have to tolerate some uncertainty. And this is going to be challenging. It really is, because there is, are going to be critics of everything we do that tries to speed this up. After initial testing to determine a product's safety and level of activity against Ebola, the most promising therapeutics need to be deployed in the field. That's their wording. What that really means is they have to be deployed in Africa. That's where the problem is. And then the ethical dilemmas come in. Is it right to use black Africans as guinea pigs to test this drug? What's the alternative? Who is going to make that decision? Certainly, the countries where they would test it, be tested have to agree to it. Countries, meaning governments, I have never seen any government in any country act quickly. And we need speed right now. So my last, I guess one more slide. That's absolutely my last slide. So um, some of you may have seen Channel 2 Horizon show from BBC. They have a great story about this. I say great because I'm included in it, so I, I kind of like that. But, but, uh, but it, it is a good way if you want to learn more about what has been done. Right now the focus is when are we going to have more ZMAP? Who's going to pay for it? Who will decide who gets it? I think the next six months to a year are going to be a tipping point in the way we deal with drug development for the developing world. Not just for Ebola, river blindness, schistosomiasis, uh, dengue, a whole bunch of other things that in the U.S., if you ask, do you want to bend the rules so we get a faster cure for river blindness? Most people in the U.S. would say, what? What's river blindness? Never even heard of it. It's not, our, it's not urgent for me. I don't want to bend any rules for that. Somebody has to participate. I think this is going to be a massive public-private discussion. And if there's anything good that has come out of Ebola, it's pretty hard to say there is, but if there's anything good, it's going to be bringing forward a discussion that we sorely need. Thank you very much.